So we can determine if there are holes in the space by checking the failure of irrotational vector fields being conservative. We know that conservative vector fields are always irrotational. If f is the grad of some potential, then its curl has to be zero. But if we look at the vector fields for which the curl is equal to zero, then they're not necessarily conservative, but an irrotational vector field on a space with no holes, that is conservative. If an irrotational vector field is not conservative, if we're on a space on which an irrotational vector field is not given by the grad of some potential, that tells us that the space that we are on has holes in it. In other words, we can measure the geometry of a space by looking at the failure of irrotational vector fields to be conservative. So let's look at an example of this. Consider the vector field f given by f of xy is equal to, in the i direction, minus y over x squared plus y squared, and in the j direction, given by x over x squared plus y squared. To simplify things, we'll write u of x for the first component, namely we'll write u of xy as minus y over x squared plus y squared, and we'll write v of xy for the j component, namely v of xy is equal to x over x squared plus y squared. The curl of f is then given by the cross product of grad and the vector field. In other words, we have the determinant of this matrix here, which we saw before is just given by the vector with kth component specified by the x derivative of v minus the y derivative of u. We can see that the x derivative of v is given by y squared minus x squared divided by x squared plus y squared all squared. And similarly, the y derivative of u is given by y squared minus x squared over x squared plus y squared all squared as well. So the kth vector outputted by the curl is zero, and so in particular the curl of this vector field is identically zero. So we want to see if the vector field f is indeed conservative. That is, whether we can find a smooth function f from r2 to r, such that f is given by the gradient of this smooth potential. So recall that f of xy is given by this formula here, and if this vector field is conservative, it means that the i component is given by the x partial derivative of f, and the j component is given by the y partial derivative of f. To find such an f, we observe that the partial derivative of f necessarily has to be given by the first component, i.e. the x partial derivative of f is given by minus y over x squared plus y squared. If we integrate both sides with respect to x, we find that f is given by minus the integral of y over x squared plus y squared dx, or in other words, f is given by minus arctan of x over y plus some constant. Now if we differentiate f equal to minus arctan of x over y plus some constant with respect to y, we see that the y partial derivative of f is given by minus the y partial derivative of arctan of x over y, and that this is just x over x squared plus y squared. So from these calculations, it appears that f is conservative, since we can write f as the gradient of some function f, namely we can take f to be arctan of y over x. But this is not the case. Notice that f is not even defined when x equals zero, so f can't be conservative. The property of being conservative is a global property. It needs to be true everywhere. A more transparent way of seeing this is achieved by changing coordinates. So what we'll do is we'll set x equal to r cosine theta, and we'll set y equal to r sine of theta. Then arctan of y over x is given by arctan of r sine theta over r cosine theta. The r's will cancel, so we end up with arctan of sine theta over cosine theta. But sine theta over cosine theta is tan theta, and so we end up with just theta. So f being given by grad of arctan of y over x implies that f is given by the grad of the angle function. But the angle function theta cannot be continuously defined at the origin. Indeed, if we go around a circle centered at the origin, 
the angle we end up with when we go all the way around is equal to 2 pi, and it's not the value we started with, namely we started with 0. One can get a very explicit idea of what's going on here by looking at MC Escher's picture of the staircase. The staircase appears to be increasing, but if you go the full way around you don't end up any further than where you started. So we've seen that we can study the geometry of a space by looking at loops on the space, locally constant functions, so those functions for which the derivative is equal to zero everywhere, and irrotational vector fields. Now this, these locally constant functions and irrotational vector fields, they're really the same because curl being zero is the same as the derivative of the vector field being zero if you interpret this in the right way. So what we've really seen is two different ways of looking at the geometry of a space. We've looked at loops on the space, and we've looked at locally constant functions. So notice that loops on the space are just functions gamma, let's say from the interval 0 to 1, into x. While locally constant functions on x are functions out of x into the real line. In particular, loops measure the geometry by looking at maps into x, while locally constant functions study the geometry of the space by looking at functions out of x. So this is an example of something called duality, and is one of the most important concepts in mathematics. Okay, so at this point you're probably asking, so what does this have to do with Euler's number being geometric? What do loops and vector fields and locally constant functions have to do with numbers, let alone Euler's number? 